Ancient Greece seems like it was a pretty great place. It was the birthplace of democracy. It had a flourishing art scene, a vibrant mythology, and spectacular architecture. Prominent intellectuals like Aristotle and Plato made huge leaps in scientific and philosophical reasoning. The land was fertile, and the wine flowed like water. It was a veritable utopia of free thought and civilizational achievement. Or was it? Welcome back to Nutty History. Today, we're looking at the dark, dirty secrets of ancient Greece, from zombie apocalypses to questionable beauty trends. If you lived in Athens in the 7th century BC, then you could have faced death for stealing a cabbage. Around 621 BC, Athens instituted its first written constitution. Before then, the legal system was based on a system of oral law. There was no neat set of defined laws and penalties for crimes, and usually it was the victim's responsibility to seek justice for some crime committed against them. This could lead to blood feuds that lasted for generations. What's more, the aristocracy would often manipulate these laws to benefit themselves as they saw fit, which led to a vastly unequal society. So it was eventually agreed that reform was needed. The reform, though, ended up being a very harsh system where death or enslavement was handed out for even minor crimes. These first written laws were called the Draconian Constitution, penned by a little-known aristocrat named Draco. They failed to end the inequality between the aristocracy and common people. For one thing, it set up the debt enslavement system we mentioned earlier, where wealthy landowners could enslave their tenants if they didn't pay their debts. For another, only those who carried weapons or owned a certain amount of land had any political rights. Also, many of the punishments didn't seem to fit the crimes. You could serve death for stealing, but if you accidentally dispatched someone and then apologized to the person's family, you'd be off the hook. Draco's laws were eventually deemed to, well, draconian. In 594 BC, just a few decades after they were enacted, they were repealed by the lawmaker Solon and replaced with a more lenient set of laws. Our modern culture is obsessed with zombies, from The Walking Dead to I Am Legend to seas of kids dressed up as undead for Halloween. Zombies and the zombie apocalypse have become part of movie coverage. And it turns out that the Greeks were pretty into zombies too. Despite developing philosophies that revolved around logic, rational thought, and discourse, the ancient Greeks also seemed to fear the undead emerging from their graves and stalking the streets, roaming around and attacking people as a way of getting revenge for their own death. Archaeologists have found graves where the deceased had been weighed down with rocks or large fragments of pottery, so they were unable to rise up and stumble freely around, biting people. Old writing from the time also mentioned zombies, calling them revenants. Often, people with mysterious illnesses or deformities would be suspected of becoming zombies after they were put in the ground, and grave sites uncovered in various sites within the ancient Greek territory seem to confirm this. Carrie Weaver, a prominent Greek archaeologist, has written that it is clear that many members of Greek society thought that the dead could roam the earth. They imagined scenarios in which reanimated corpses rose from their graves, prowled the streets, and stalked unsuspecting victims, often to exact retribution denied to them in life. The Greeks also had a famous zombie type of legend, Vrykolakis. Vrykolakis was an undead creature, kind of in between a zombie and a vampire, that would eat whoever was unlucky enough to cross its path. If you were a woman living in ancient Greece and wanted to put on some makeup, it was very likely you were applying lead to your face. Lead was a common ingredient in ancient Greek cosmetics. The word itself comes from the Greek cosmetica, and the act of beautifying one's face was to komotikon. Although Greek writers, who were mostly men, typically frowned upon komotikon, saying it was mostly used by women of the night and other lower-class women, it's now widely accepted that pretty much all classes of women, and even some men, use makeup to highlight their features and brighten their skin. But the lead paste they used often led to horrible disfigurement and scarring, eating away at the skin and causing disease. In a vicious cycle, it would be applied in thicker and thicker amounts to cover up the damage it was already causing. Komotokon fell under a more general word for beauty in ancient Greece, which was known as kalos. Kalos wasn't just external beauty. The Greeks believed that outward beauty was also a sign of someone's internal beauty. If you were beautiful, then you were a morally good person and vice versa. 
It was around this time that the Greek mathematician Pythagoras discovered the golden ratio. Balance and symmetry became linked to beauty of all kinds, in nature and in humans. Symmetrical faces were thus considered the most beautiful faces. It went so far in ancient Greece that unibrows became all the rage. Unibrows, a feared facial feature now which many people try to hide through plucking or shaving, were considered more beautiful because they were more symmetrical. Many people would go so far as to use coal, an Egyptian type of mascara made with more lead-based ingredients, to paint on a unibrow if they were unlucky enough not to have been blessed by the gods with a lusciously joined brow. Ah yes, the things we do for beauty. Medicine in ancient Greece was definitely a step up from what it was before, but it was still ancient in a lot of ways. For one thing, before the 5th century BC, illness was considered divine punishment exacted by the gods. If you died, the gods were to blame, and if you got better, it was because the gods gave you a gift. By 500 BC, things were starting to get a bit more refined, but the distinction between science and religion was often quite blurry. The Greek god Asclepius, for example, was both a divine healer and a highly skilled doctor. However, there were no professional qualifications for being a doctor. Anyone could roam around ancient Greece saying they were doctors, practicing the techne, or mysterious art of medicine. Had some kind of malady? Oftentimes, bloodletting would be prescribed. The ancient Greeks were big fans of it. Bloodletting was connected to a medicinal system called humorism, though there wasn't much that was funny about it. In humorism, the human body is split into four humors – blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. In a healthy person, these four components were in proper balance, but pain or illness would pop up if they became out of whack. A lot of the time, temperature was directly connected to the humors. For example, hot foods were thought to produce yellow bile, while cold foods produced phlegm. Cities exposed to cold winds were associated with lung disease and hot winds with digestive problems. Humorism was practiced long after ancient Greece. It wasn't until the 1850s and the advent of germ theory that it fell out of favor among physicians around the world. If you were living in Athens around 430 BC, there was a 1 in 3 chance you would have died. During the Spartan siege of Athens during the Peloponnesian War, a mysterious outbreak killed more than a third of the population. No one really knows what the culprit was. Some think it was typhus, others influenza or measles, some say Ebola. According to the historian Thucydides, the plague may have originated somewhere in Africa, spreading through the Persian Empire and finally making its way into Athens. Symptoms included fever, followed by inflamed eyes and bleeding from the mouth and respiratory failure. The outbreak led to chaos within Athens, where nearly 100,000 people died, a tragedy compounded by the Spartan siege. The whole situation left Athens in tatters and ultimately signaled the end of its golden age. Athens would be absorbed by Sparta about 25 years later. So there you have it. For all of ancient Greece's incredible achievements, life for most of us during this great civilization would have probably been pretty gross, pretty brutish, and pretty short. Thanks for watching Nutty History. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History content.